Hello everyone, this is Bob Browner with Cornu Coronavirus Update number 110, and today we'll talk about the fact that uh, current trends are looking great, which is nice, but uh, how do we make sure this is the last major COVID surge? In the short version, of course, is everybody get their third shot, which we'll go into in just a minute. So uh, numbers, uh, at least locally, for example, Lincoln, our, our uh, case rates are really, really low, and, and of course having that corresponding drop in hospitalizations, which is very good to see. Uh, Lincoln, uh, our updated dashboard, provides a lot of detail on hospitalizations total, uh, and you'll notice that, that some, sometimes in the past the problem is the state numbers don't add up based on the local numbers because they're using a the only the confirmed, not the presumed, so that's why those numbers don't add up. But uh, in full transparency, uh, Health Department at least puts all of those numbers. But again, those numbers are really low. Uh, basically, our hospitalization rates is as low as it's been since July. Hopefully, we can drop down to June levels soon. Um, that we're actually down yesterday to one uh, co uh, COVID patient in the ICU, which is really great to hear. Uh, link numbers in the schools are also dropping uh, pretty dramatically. Uh, we don't have complete numbers for this week yet, but uh, you know, in the comparison of six, seven weeks ago, we were 1,200 cases a week. Now we're down to 50 last week. Uh, we were over 200 a day. Yesterday, we only had three out of 42,000 kids, so uh, really argues we're heading in the right direction. Uh, UNL numbers also showing the same thing with their positivity rates dropping as well. So uh, good news all around and consistent with the region. And so this is HHS region seven, which is us, which is a four state. But again, you'll see the same uh, trajectory. We hit that huge peak, but dropping down to where we were in July. Hopefully we will down to June levels soon and uh, that will really give everybody a, a breather. Uh, and then I uh, was asked uh, uh, by a reporter yesterday, last night, we did re rescind our research emergency powers for LPS for because of the pandemic, because things are looking so good. Uh, one question is, will we have to put those in again? And I'd say, well, we shouldn't have to. Uh, the key, though, is will we uh, do a better job next time? Uh, we had so little data when we put the emergency powers in place, uh, but we have all the tools we need to make sure we don't do this again. The question is, will we put those tools in place and use them correctly next time? Uh, so I hope we never have to put emergency powers again for COVID. COVID, but you know I can't predict the future. Uh, unfortunately, partly it's based on state and national uh, trends. Uh, I think a perfect case study and why this may or may not happen is LB859, and so you may not be aware of this, but uh, Lincoln has its own uh, because of a grandfathering and because our health department existed before the statutes that regulate health departments. Lincoln Lancaster County still can make its own rules, which is a good thing uh, for the most part. I, I can I think you can make an argument there should be cohesion across the state, but only if it's evidence based. Uh, and this uh, hearing uh, was really frustrating to hear. Uh, you had the senator claiming that there is no strong evidence or data that supports uh, Lincoln doing their own thing. Well, I'd say actually there's really really strong evidence. Uh, I often tell people the ultimate judge of who is wrong or right in health, public health and healthcare is dead versus not dead because there's not a lot of debate there, at least there shouldn't be anyway. Uh, it's a little harder to calculate those numbers in Nebraska because the data in Nebraska is hidden unlike other states. However, you can piece it together. So because Lincoln and Omaha and Sarpy County report numbers, you can subtract their numbers from the state numbers and recreate it yourself. Uh, which I've done. So you can go to the CDC website, see that the there are 4,017 uh, presumptive deaths. Uh, means that actually we've done you know better than most other states. Honestly, uh, we could have done better though if there had been a state cohesion with uh, with an evidence state based approach like we did in Lincoln. But then we can subtract those numbers, the 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 local numbers, and then get a comparison for both within Nebraska and around the state. Uh, which I've done here. And so if you take a look at that, you'll see that the COVID fortality rate in the Lincoln Lancaster County is half to a third of what it was in the rest of the state and surrounding states. Uh, the one caveat there, people will point out, what about Bellevue Sarpy County? Uh, their numbers are about the same as Lincoln. They didn't do as much, which I would say, yes, their numbers are compare are uh, the deaths are comparable. However, it's not an equal comparison group. You're not comparing apples to apples because Bellevue Sarpy County has a younger population. So therefore, their numbers should be even lower than that. But they're not. Now, you can confirm this if you, you were able to do age adjusted uh, comparison, but the, only the state has the data to do that. Uh, I and others would be help, happy to, to, to run those numbers if we had access to that data. Uh, but this is the best we can do from the outside at this point. But again, dead versus not dead, it just doesn't get much stronger than this. Um, uh, another unfortunate thing, you know, during the questioning, uh, there was a comment that, uh, that there is no uh, evidence on health outcomes between jurisdictions where masks were required and where they weren't. That's actually not true. There's actually quite a bit of evidence. And so just yesterday, a study came out uh, in Mor Morbidity and Mortality Weekly of a study in Arkansas, again, showing that universal mask requirements in a school setting had a 23% lower incidence of COVID-19 among staff and students. And this is actually not a new funding, finding even in schools. Uh, last year, we had multiple studies, again, showing the exact same thing. So one out of Utah, for example, and you can go back and read this. I've put a link in the notes section if you want to look at 
either the Arkansas study, the Utah study, or the Georgia study, all saying the same thing, that masks work. And this has been done not only in schools, uh, where, like this Georgia study, uh, but even go all the way back, this is June of 2020. Uh, so this is actually a Na uh, Navy Times study that was also reported in the CDC, uh, where uh, during the aircraft carrier outbreak on the Theodore Roosevelt, and sailors who wore masks had lower infection rates. And so this has been reproduced over and over again. Uh, I'm surprising to me that someone would comment that there's no studies when there are actually quite a few studies on this. Uh, and there's even dollars and cents studies. So what I do in my day job, I am a chief medical officer, One Health Nebraska's ACO. We actually get Medicare reports on our population that we're attributed. To. So we have almost 10,000 patients. And what they do, because they, they take out our COVID costs and they don't hold us accountable for COVID costs, and they give us our, our population's healthcare costs with and without COVID, I can actually ca calculate the variance. And so if you look at our cost per COVID, when I subtract this from this, we, we're spending about $214 per patient on COVID, whereas the rest of the country is spending $531 on COVID. Well, we subtract that from that, multiply it times the population we take care of. Our healthcare costs due to COVID on our Medicare population alone in Lincoln is $3 million. Uh, if we added up the Bryan Health and CHI patients and uh, other insurance plans, it'd probably be in the tens of millions. And so not only did we save lives, not only did we help keep our schools open, we actually saved millions and millions of dollars of healthcare costs by putting in these mask ordinances and vaccinating to a higher degree than other populations. And so yes, there's plenty of evidence. Um, and I, I would say it would be nice to have state cohesion because uh, that did add to the confusion, but only if it's evidence-based. Uh, but in the testimony, it did came out, uh, Dr. Uh, or Senator Williams asked, you know, are, are people making decisions all medical in nature? And, and the answer is no, they're not. Uh, a lot of politicians are making these decisions, sometimes not informed by the evidence. Uh, so I would say if there was a state uh, decision making, it should be, one, it should be an open, like our school board meetings, they're governed by the Open Meetings Act. These decisions should be done in the open to get rid of some of the suspicion and, uh, out there and also should include public health experts and there aren't that heck you know, we're small states there aren't a heck of a lot of us and we all know each other and none of us were in that room so uh, at least whereas in Lincoln uh, the mayor does not provide the input this is actually a health department decision whereas the, in the state level right now it's a political decision not a health public health decision so if it were state level uh, it needs to be an open to process and it needs to be driven uh, and informed by public health experts uh, of course they can't have all to say certainly politicians are involved as well because there's the policy reasons but there sh should be an informed by people who read the evidence though uh, and as opposed to people com com uh, comparing mask mandates to forced genital manipulation I, I don't know what to say to that other than you're probably wearing the mask wrong, wrong if that's what you're saying so preventing the ma next major surge well we have the tools in place to do that, and it's basically the best way to avoid another surge that's severe is a third shot. We may have more cases, but that, that's not cases we're sort of worried about, it's hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, and so in Lincoln, we do track that, so you can see one versus two versus three shots, that salmon Kelly, there's a third shot. We've done a really good job in the elderly population, but we've got a ways to go in the younger population. Um, and one other way to look at this is the COVID risk pyramid. And so some people will say, well, but there's studies showing the vaccine isn't effective anymore. Well, to which I say, well, vaccine effective against what? Uh, we're not worried about whether, you know, it'd be nice if the vaccine stopped all infections. It doesn't, and it probably can't against Omicron because the incubation phase is too short for your memory B cells to kick in. But if all you get is a runny nose, we're really not worried about this. So uh, is it vaccine effectiveness against runny nose or is it vaccine effectiveness against dead or hospital? That's the key determinant. And the good news is, yes, the vaccine is not as effective against runny nose in kids after a few while. However, even with the when they get the third shot, it's actually even partly effective against, but it's very, very effective as against being dead, being in the hospital, or having long COVID complications. That's what we're really worried. That's the, the the bad surge. If if COVID only caused runny nose, we just wouldn't care about this anymore. And the way to turn it into a runny nose virus is to get your third shot. Um, the safety monitoring is just keeps getting better and better. And actually the third shot for that third shot in kids, this study is showing that actually the myocarditis carditis risk on the third shot is actually less. Uh, and we have plenty of safety data now. Uh, we have now given over 10 billion doses. That's billion with a B worldwide. We have plenty of data showing the effectiveness of this. And if you want a really, really strong rundown, I would go to Caitlin Jettelina's post from March 4th, where she reviews all many of these studies on uh, on children. Uh, so for example, yes, there is a risk of myocarditis with that vaccine. However, the vaccine-induced myocarditis is much milder compared to the COVID-19-induced myocarditis. And people keep forgetting COVID-19 causes a higher rate of myocarditis and more severe and potentially deadly, whereas no myocarditis deaths have been linked to the vaccine. So the vaccine is a much safer approach than actually getting it, quote, the natural way. And the problem with
problem with getting back, uh, the virus the natural way is the immunity you get is so erratic and unpredictable. Yes, it does provide some immunity, but is it a predictable amount of immunity? Kind of like there are some old medications, like for example, for heart failure, you could use digitalis leaf, but their dosage was so erratic, people would sometimes get benefit and sometimes get toxic. The reason we turned it into a pill is to precisely control the dosage. The same thing is true for this coronavirus vaccine. Yes, getting it the hard way uh, comes with a lot higher risk, but also the immunity to get is so unpredictable. You're mu you have a much more predictable immunity when you get vaccinated. And as far as the future, well, you know, look at who did well and who did not do well. So countries that did really good with getting people their third shot, countries like Italy and Ireland and the United Kingdom and Spain, for example, they didn't have this surge that we had last. They had the surge of cases, but they didn't have the surge of hospitalizations and deaths because they did such a good job of vaccinating their people. The United States did not. And the next poster child for getting it wrong is going to be Hong Kong, because not only did they not do a good job of getting a third shot. They also used the Sinovac, which isn't as effective, and they didn't vaccinate a lot of their elderly. So the bodies are going to be piled up in Hong Kong. So there is unfortunately one country that really is going to get it wrong. And you'll see that play out here over the next month or, month or two. So getting that third shot, that's the best way to ensure that this is our last surge that uh, uh, we have to worry about like this. Um, the other thing we could do in the future is create a much better infectious disease monitoring system. And so, the, for example, a friend of mine, Dr. Don Rice, uh, shares with me his uh, viral panels. And basically, uh, they also, the company that he uses, they provide uh, regional uh, comparisons. So you can kind of see what's happening. And so there are, four, uh, there are three other viruses that cause a lot of deaths every year. You know, influenza kills about 30,000 a year. Uh, RSV is a problem in kids. And human metanumovirus is a newer virus we're finding out causes a lot of those non-bacterial pneumonias. Well, why don't we put into a, a system in place so we can track when COVID or metanovirus or, or uh, influenza or RSV is coming. We have the possibility to do this. We've got a lot of public health funding. We should create a monitoring system, which would give us plenty of time to prepare next time so we don't get caught uh, with our pants down like we did with COVID two years ago. So hopefully this is helpful to you. The links to these studies are in the notes section, so go down there and read the, more if you'd like to. Uh, and uh, again, disclaimer, these are my opinions, not necessarily of everybody else, but this gives you some verification of who I am, what I do, and that I'm gainfully employed in the field of public health.